Welcome to the Sizer online tutorial for the US edition. This is the first of a three part training video going over the features of concept mode in the Sizer software. We call concept mode a preliminary gravity load design tool. It is possible to create structure up to six stories to design columns, stud walls, beams, joists, and CLT panels. You can input line, area, and point loads, and Sizer will automatically distribute loads based on tributary area and transfer the loads from the top to the bottom story. The tool will give you a preliminary size for your members, create material lists for costing purposes, and report reactions at the base of the members. We refer to concept mode as a preliminary design tool because of some of its design assumptions and limits, such as columns and walls are assumed to be pinned at both ends, combined loads cannot be applied, and there is no bearing design, among other restrictions. That being said, it is possible to refine the design of members directly in beam or column mode. When it comes to pattern loading, if you have a multi-span beam, the code requires that pattern load cases for live loads need to be checked, so the design of the member may end up being different in beam mode after further analysis of the member is completed. The way concept mode works is that you make your way across the taskbar at the top, adding grid lines, then specifying columns and walls. Once walls and columns are specified, options for beams and floors will become available so that you can draw them in your structure. Like most programs, it is best to specify the unit system you want to use before starting anything. The default for the US version is Imperial, but you can navigate to the Settings Format tab and switch to metric units if you desire. Another very important step is establishing your snap increment. By default, the snap increment is 12 inch, but you can change this to whatever you want, depending on the spacing of the members in your project and the level of details you require. This can be modified in the View tab. If you decide to automatically generate a grid, which we will discuss next, the grid system will be based on the snap increment specified in this tab. In this example, we will specify a snap increment of 30 inch for both north to south and east to west directions. So before you can start drawing the various members, it is necessary to establish grid lines. There are two options for doing this. The first option is to specify grid lines manually. When in the grid line view, if you click on the blank screen, you will establish a grid point based on the snap increment previously specified. As you can see, when clicking on a specific point, it will generate a grid line on the closest 30 inch snap increment value defined. If you are not happy with where you placed it, you can modify the grid line's position independently of the snap increment by toggling a grid line and changing its location at the top right of the window. Alternatively, you can choose to automatically generate a grid system based on your snap increment. This is done by clicking the edit icon, then generate grid button. It is possible to delete a specific grid line by selecting it and pressing the delete button. You can select multiple grid lines by holding the control key. After establishing the grid lines, we can add up to six stories in the level section under the design tab or by clicking the floor and roof levels icon, which will make the window shown here to display. To add a story, specify the height of the new story and click add. A new story will automatically be added. The level with the highest elevation will automatically be assigned as the roof. Now that all the preliminary information has been entered, we can specify columns, walls, beams, joists, and CLT panels on each floor inside concept mode. When inserting new columns, it is only possible to locate them on the intersection of the grid lines. To assign a column at a specific location outside of the snap increment range, you would have to modify the grid line manually, as mentioned earlier. For every member type, if you click the Material Design Group icon, a window will appear where you can specify the material, size and bracing, and service conditions for each group. Another feature is to define multiple design groups, each with a different set of details. This is useful for when different types of columns are used in the same story. 
For example, if 4x4 four four sections are used as interior columns and 6x6 six six used as exterior columns, you could specify two column groups. Once the groups are defined, you could select all the interior and exterior columns respectively and assign them with the group details previously defined. This eliminates the need to specify the details for each individual columns and saves time during the modeling process. In order to assign the newly created column details to multiple columns, you would have to select them by pressing the control key and choose the group in the toolbar. If you leave unknown parameters when defining the group, concept mode will base the design of that group on the member with the highest loading. To insert walls into the structure, you will have to go to the walls view tab. Modeling walls in concept mode is easy. All you have to do is click the left mouse button on an intersection of a grid line and while holding onto the left mouse button, drag the cursor to the other grid point and release. You can specify walls in pretty much any location, just as long as they do not overlap with an existing wall or beam. The wall design group table is similar to the ones we have just talked about in the column section, with inputs proper to walls and the option to design with either wall studs or wall CLT panels as the group type. Similar to how a wall was drawn, when inserting beams, you have to click and drag the left mouse from one column to the other with the possibility of having cantilevers. Note that you cannot use walls to support a beam. When going to the Materials Design Group tab, while inside the beam view, you will notice a load transfer number input. Concept mode will allow you to transfer loads between beam members using what is known as a load transfer number. So for instance, if I want beam B3 to frame into members B1 and B2, I need to make sure beam B3 has a higher load transfer number. If this is not the case, a warning will appear stating that you cannot use a beam with identical load transfer number as support. So in this example, I have left the load transfer number of members B1 and B2 as the default of 0. Then, so that beam B3 can frame into members B1 and B2, I have made a separate beam design group and specified the load transfer number of 1, which is higher than the other members. The number could be 2, 3, or whatever, as long as it is higher than the members it is framing into. Now, it is possible to draw the beam member that frames into both of these beams. When clicking the Joists View tab, you can start adding joists to the model. In order to do that, you will have to specify four points on the grid where they are intersected. In fact, the created joist area must have at least two parallel sides and must be fully spanned by at least two supports in any direction, which means that the first and last joist must rest on the same supporting members. Failing to do so will generate the following warning message, stating one of the restrictions I have just mentioned. If you right-click whilst in the process of creating the floor joist, it will cancel it so you can reassign the four points of the joist. It is important to mention that the joists will automatically span in the shortest direction unless they are unsupported in that direction. To change the direction, you will have to highlight the joist in question and change its direction from the pull-down menu in the top toolbar. The joist design group window is the same for roof and floor joist, with the exception of the default deflection limit values. In fact, for roof joist, the deflection limit is less stringent, with a live load limit of L under 240 and a total limit of L under 180, compared to L under 360 and L under 240 respectively for floor joists. This difference is explained in video 1, Understanding Beam Input. Once the structure is adequately designed, the next step is to add loads. By pressing the Load View tab, information regarding the level, type, distribution and magnitudes can be entered. When selecting area as the distribution type, you have to select four points where you want the load area to be included. Note that if you apply a load over the entire floor plan, any spot where there is no floor area will be ignored and the software will recognize only the loads where there is a joist area. To examine the critical member for a particular group, go back to the plan view and select the member by clicking on it. Now, change to beam mode or column mode 
by pressing the mode button on the toolbar or by selecting the appropriate mode in the mode menu. Sizer first determines the forces on the member based on the applied loads and the configuration of the structural members.